Having served various city as a mark of virility, servility, and gentility, circumcision has, throughout the centuries, worn many symbolic hats. While anthropologists disagree as to the definitive origins of circumcision, the earliest hard evidence comes from the first ancient Egyptian mummies of considerable vintage, around 2300 BC. That being said, Egyptian paintings date circumcision to centuries prior, depicting ritual circumcision as prerequisite to entering the priesthood. Contention remains as to whether circumcision was a sign of pride rather than prejudice among the ancient Egyptian world. While popular among the elite, forced circumcision was inflicted on captured Phoenician and Jewish slaves as a badge of dishonor, more practical or rather less lethal than castration. Whatever its initial origins, by 1800 BC, the Jews were practicing circumcision for religious reasons in deference to God's religious injunction to Abraham as contained in the Torah. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you." Genesis 17, 10-11. Though the religious reasons have remained ostensibly the same for thousands of years, the procedure has changed rather sharply. The original practice, Milah, was abbreviated to only the removal of the tip of the foreskin. The decision to snip beyond the tip lay in the cultural collision between Greco-Roman and Jewish cultures. While the Jews considered circumcision, among matters theistic, the Greeks regarded it as an aesthetic faux pas. As Hellenic culture became the fashion throughout the Roman Empire, Jews seeking to avoid discrimination and compete in Roman games sought to emulate their hosts by stretching the foreskin and tying it closed. If this stretching is done long and regularly enough over time, the skin will grow to accommodate the missing bit. However, Jewish elders, rather unsympathetic to the when in Rome justification of the blasphemous procedure, they instated the Brit Periar around 140 AD. With this, the circumcision procedure now included removing the foreskin to beyond the ridge of the glands, ensuring all Jews would be fully shorn of Roman identity. With circumcision having assumed a distinctly Jewish connotation, it became grounds for anti-Semitic discrimination. History is littered with examples such as the Seleucid king and Antiochus occupying Jerusalem in 169 BC, who made the Brit Periar punishable by death. The Roman author Suetonius records court proceedings wherein a 90-year-old man, suspected of evading the Fiscus Judaicus, or Jewish tax, was stripped naked for what must have been the Roman take on strict scrutiny. After 50 BC, circumcision remained, at least popularly speaking, a largely Jewish affair until controversy ignited among early Christians. It was yet unclear whether the gospel required circumcision among converts, which would thus restrict Christianity to Jews or Gentiles willing to undergo the procedure. Given this might have nipped the spread of Christianity in the bud, at least among adult males, it was decided that circumcision was not prerequisite to conversion, and the Catholic Church maintained a degree of hostility towards the practice which would set the tone for circumcision until the 19th century. The Greco-Roman aversion towards circumcision, once heavily assaulted with anti-Semitism, persisted long after unruly ghouls had overrun the empire. Indeed, by the time Britain had matured to imperial status, explorers who had been busily exporting British commerce and colonial Colonialism returns with salacious tales about the barbaric tribes that layered the extremities of the empire and the varieties of circumcision practiced within. Sir Richard Burton wrote of one such procedure that tears off the epidermis from the cuts around the groin and flays the testicles and penis, ending with amputation of the foreskin. Certain Islamic people, such as those of the Mughal Empire, introduced the British to circumcision in a rather more unceremonious fashion, claiming the foreskins of vanquished British troops willy-nilly on the battlefield. Despite the initial close shaves between the British and other cultures, they eventually spearheaded a change in attitude about circumcision. Partially inspired by a sense of cultural cosmopolitanism or fear of troops losing their heads under threat of battlefield circumcision, the British began a revival of circumcision. The social and hygienic virtues of circumcision were well entrenched during the Victorian era, with British royalty beginning a practice of circumcising their heirs, the peerage following suit, and the change in attitudes radiating downwards through British society and empire. This is not to say that the religious element of circumcision subsided. Indeed, one reason for the surge in circumcision in some regions was precisely to make it slightly more difficult, or more aptly uncomfortable, to commit the alleged sin of masturbation than if one's foreskin was fully intact. Further, during both world wars, the political and racial subtext of circumcision
circumcision re-emerged with bloody consequence. Forced circumcision accompanied the massacre of Armenians under the Ottoman Empire, while circumcision served again as a potentially lethal marker of Jewish identity under Nazi Germany. In the present day, however, racial and class controversies regarding circumcision have cooled. Nonetheless, the demographic pattern and medical consensus regarding circumcision have remained far from settled. The size of the circumcised British population has dropped precipitously from 30% at its heyday to roughly 4% today. The United States has remained steady, with well over half of the male population being circumcised, and Israel has, unsurprisingly, become the circumcision capital of the world, with nearly a 100% circumcision rate. Even within largely circumcised populations, health debates rage. Critics of circumcision cite an absence of evidence vis-a-vis -vis the supposed health benefits of circumcision, and list a litany of disadvantages, such as pain to the child, infection, urinary complications, enhanced risk of disease, and in extremely rare cases, even death from complications due to the circumcision. One in 500,000, or about eight babies per year in the United States, dying as a result of the procedure. Defenders of the practice, however, claim that the health benefits outweigh the risks to the minority. They cite greater immunity from certain sexually transmitted diseases and genital cancer, as well as the supposed avoidance of certain general hygiene problems, though the latter is a bit of a stretch. These debates have been exacerbated by religious and anti-religious camps among the medical community, with the surgical soundness of some procedures, such as the rarely practiced today orthodox Judaic tradition of sucking to stem the bleeding, being called into question. To compound the issue, men do not have a monopoly as beneficiaries or victims of this surgical procedure. Female circumcision or female genital mutilation FGM, which involves partial or complete removal of the external female genitalia, has been around for centuries. Again, Egypt features as the setting for this operation with the Greek geographer Strabo, who visited around 25 BC, corroborating the records as well as writings of other observers. However, physical evidence is lacking, so the actual origin remains a mystery. One medical historian concedes there is no way of knowing as the ritual was widespread across many cultures, from Australian Aborigine tribes to various African societies. Like many who support male circumcision, cultural, religious, mythical, medical, and even aesthetic motives are offered as justification. So devoted are some advocates of female circumcision that in 1930 the future Kenyan Prime Minister explained that the procedure was integral to the survival of Kenya's ethnic institution. Later, in the mid-1950s, when clitoridectomy was banned, young Kenyan girls even colluded with friends to perform the procedure on each other. Despite FGM advocates, the practice grew to be viewed by its detractors as barbaric, and the outcry against it has been gaining steam since the 1960s. While the debate over the health benefits of male circumcision has kept it in the good graces of some medical institutions, the World Health Organization has denounced FGM as having no health benefit, and the United Nations passed a resolution encouraging countries to abandon the practice. Bans have been implemented in several African and Western countries like Kenya 2001, Egypt 2007, Sweden 1982, the United Kingdom 1987, and the United States in 1992. Despite the cut and thrust of circumcision politics, male circumcision will almost certainly remain a point of pride and tradition, primarily for religious reasons, but also on a much lesser scale for aesthetic reasons, a viewpoint poignantly represented by the character of Elaine on Seinfeld when she said of seeing an uncircumcised penis, it has no face, no personality, it was like a Martian. Today, male circumcision still remains overwhelmingly popular in Israel, as well as in the Middle East and North African countries where it seems to have originated, but in Western countries the procedure is declining rapidly. As to female circumcision, remarkably, the data indicates that it is on the rise among the immigrant population in the West. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of the anti-masturbation crowd among certain religious groups, despite famed priest Martin Luther himself once stating, Nature never lets up, to say it crudely, but honestly, if it doesn't go into a woman, it goes into your shirt. The Christian church, among others, took an extra hard stance against masturbation for a while there. Not one to play it politically correct, Mark Twain was happy to make light of public sentiment on this topic in a lecture he gave to the Stomach Club in 1879 called Some Thoughts on the Science of Onanism. If you're wondering, 
Onan was the guy from the Old Testament who was killed for spilling his seed on the ground instead of in the lady. While this is often pointed to as definitive proof, the Bible is saying no to masturbation, with the support here being that it wastes sperm because, you know, there's an incredibly limited supply, anyone who actually bothers to read the whole story would see that the issue doesn't appear to have been that, but more that he was supposed to be knocking up his deceased brother's widow. He did go ahead and have sex with her, but then he pulled out so his brother would have no male heir, and thus Onan himself would be entitled to a greater inheritance. Naturally, this didn't go over well, given he was disobeying his father's direct order, strike one, didn't do his brotherly duty to help his brother's line live on, strike two, and finally, rather than just refusing outright, he went to Head and had sex, but didn't give the lady the baby juice, and that would be strike three. And then, of course, you can tack on that he was being greedy to boot. In any event, Twain began his speech on onanism by referring to the act as a species of recreation to which I perceive you are much addicted. He goes on, Homer in the second book of the Iliad says with fine enthusiasm, give me masturbation or give me death. Caesar in his commentary says, to the lonely it is company, to the forsaken it is a friend, to the aged and to the impotent it is a benefactor. They that are penniless are yet rich in that they still have this majestic diversion. In another place, this experienced observer has said, there are times when I prefer it to sodomy. Robinson Crusoe says, I cannot describe what I owe to this gentle art. Queen Elizabeth said, It is the bulwark of virginity. Setawayo, the Zulu hero, remarked, A jerk in the hand is worth two in the bush. The immortal Franklin has said, Masturbation is the best policy. Michelangelo said to Pope Julius II, Self negation is noble, self culture beneficent, self possession is manly. But to the truly great and inspiring soul, they are poor and tame compared with self abuse. Obviously a fan, Twain remained faithful to his journalistic roots and gave equal time to those who were not enamored with the ancient art, noting Brigham Young, an expert of incontestable authority, said, as compared with the other thing, it is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. Solomon said, there is nothing to recommend it but its cheapness. Galen said, it is shameful to degrade to such bestial uses that grand limb, that formidable member, which we votaries of science dubbed the major maxillary, when they dub it at all, which is seldom. It would be better to amputate the os frontis than to put it to such use. Twain then turned to Darwin and the noble monkey, stating, Mr. Darwin was grieved to feel obliged to give up his theory that the monkey was the connecting link between man and the lower animals. I think he was too hasty. The monkey is the only animal, except man, that practices this science. Hence, he is our brother. There is a bond of sympathy and relationship between us. Give this ingenious animal an audience of the proper kind, and he will straightway put aside his other affairs and take a wet, and you will see, by his contortions, and his ecstatic expression that he takes an intelligent and human interest in his performance. Like a modern roast today, Twain couldn't resist sticking it to his audience a bit as he opined that those who indulge in the recreation too much can be easily detected by their disposition to eat, to drink, to smoke, to meet together convivially, to laugh, to joke, and tell indelic stories. Ultimately, however, Twain explains that this science was the least efficacious of all sexual acts, since as an amusement it is too fleeting, as an occupation too wearing. As a public exhibition, there is no money in it. It is unsuited to the drawing room, and in the most cultured society, it has long been banished. It has, at last, in our day of progress and improvement, been degraded to brotherhood with flatulence. Among the best bred, these two arts are now indulged in only private, though by consent of the whole company, when only males are present, it is still permissible, in good society, to remove the embargo on the fundamental side. Finally, Twain concluded with these maxims. If you must gamble your life sexually, don't play a lone hand too much. When you feel a revolutionary uprising in your system, get your Vendome column down some other way. Don't jack it down. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. And as always, thank you for watching.